Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, I think this is a very timely occasion to be talking about climate change. Uh, before I start on what I want to say about climate change, just to explain what the Climate Change uh, Committee is. It's a unique committee. It's, uh, there's no parallel in, in, in British history. It was set up exactly 10 years ago on the 26th of November this year. Uh, it was set up by the Climate Change Act. It's an independent committee. Uh, the chairman is appointed by the, um, by the Minister for Climate Change, the First Minister of Scotland, the First Minister of Wales, and the First Minister, if there is one, from the North of Ireland. Uh, that means I'm appointed by a Liberal Democrat, a, uh, a Scottish Nationalist, uh, a, French, uh, a, a Welsh Socialist, and uh, a Protestant Unionist from the North of Ireland. I'm a Conservative and a Catholic. How they managed to achieve that was uh, quite difficult. But it does mean that you have an entirely independent committee. Uh, the other members, all of them, are noted scientists or economists. And our job is to produce the, uh, the budgets, the carbon budgets for Britain, because we are committed statutorily, in other words, in the law, to reduce our emissions by 80% by the year 2050. And uh, we have these budgets. We're on the fifth carbon budget, which will take us from um, 2028 to 2032, the beginning of the one to the end of the other. And uh, each of these budgets is passed by Parliament. And once it's passed by Parliament, it can't be changed, except by the permission of the Climate Change Committee. So unlike any other country in the world, we have created an independent way of establishing a route to reducing our emissions in line with what the world has to do. I'll come back to what that really means, but uh, it does mean that we have a, established an institutional framework which is now being copied by 11 or 12 other countries, and that is a growing number since the Paris Accord, when we as a world decided that we were really going to have to fight climate change in a serious manner. So Britain is in the lead, but of course, targets set 10 years ago, the 80% reduction doesn't bring you to the point at which we have decided is necessary uh, in the Paris meeting two years ago. Because what we decided then, uh, as a world, because it is unique, uh, all but one country, I think there is one country now that hasn't signed up, even North Korea has managed to sign up. I'm not quite sure how much it's doing and, or whether we'd know whether it was doing it or not, but the fact of the matter is everyone has signed up to it. But what happened at, uh, in Paris was a fascinating thing, which was that the countries most affected by climate change, in other words, most immediately affected, uh, ganged up to say, it's no good just going for ensuring that the temperature doesn't rise by more than two degrees, because that means our countries are underwater. Bangladesh, for example, has to resettle a quarter of a million people every year because of the present rises in the uh, sea level. And there are countries, of course, uh, in the Pacific who have been buying land in other countries because they know there will be no place for their own people. And they were saying to the world, look, you, you, you just can't take it that we're going to allow our countries to disappear. We, we have to have a real attempt at getting the rise in temperature down to uh, something closer to 1.5, and that's what, uh, what the international community signed up to. So why is this important? I think it's quite fascinating that we should have picked The Economist, and uh, nothing to do with me, I'm, this is to do with your, uh, your leader, so to speak, The Economist uh, uh, front page, because it is a remarkable statement by that uh, magazine, which is, after all, the voice of sensible uh, capitalism uh, should say uh, losing the war against climate change as a very central concern. And I do think we have to face the fact that uh, uh, we no longer argue about whether it's happening or not. There, there, there really isn't an argument. The, the science is so clear uh, 
that unless you're determined to refuse to fa face any facts at all, can't say that it isn't happening, and you can't say that human beings aren't causing it. Uh, and, and therefore, you have to recognize that we have this increasing problem. And if I were to dramatize it in a sense, in a way which everyone here would perfectly well understand, it's the way that I do when I'm uh, traveling around the country speaking to uh, groups of people who've got no interest in the subject at all. It is just to say, you all recognize two things. One is that spring starts earlier. If you live in the country, it's absolutely impossible not to recognize that spring starts earlier. And if you want the dates, it's very simple. If you go to Brogdale, which is the national uh, collection of fruit trees uh, in Kent, they have been keeping detailed accounts since only 1960. But since 1960, spring has come 17 days earlier. Now, th that is a terrifying fact, that in 60 years, that's the change. And, and one of the things that's frightening about it, to show what uh, damage it does, is that although the buds come 17 days earlier, the pollinators don't come out more than two days earlier. So we're not getting the pollination. Part of the po problem of pollination is not just the problems with bees. It just is the bees don't arrive at the time in which they would have arrived because nature organizes those two things to come together. And it just shows how out of kilter these things uh, 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 do become because of the change in the climate. And the, and the other thing we all know is about the rain. Not the amount of rain, but the way it comes down. Uh, when uh, I was a child, um, it, the refreshing showers was a, was a reality. I mean, it rained, seemed to me by history, seemed to remain all, rain all the time, but not very heavily. Now, as we all know, we more and more have occasions in which the rain just comes down in a sheet in a way which you would have thought of as tropical storms. And, and that, of course, is one of the reasons for the flooding. It is because so much water hits the land at such a short period of time when it didn't before. Mind you, there are other reasons. We, we've carried out farming uh, activities in a way which has compacted the soil. We've uh, uh, done drainage, which means that the water goes straight into the rivers, and that means that the rivers rise very fast, all sorts of other things. But the, the key thing is that we have a different kind of climate. Now, if you're John Redwood or somebody like that, of course, you, can't com you, you confuse climate and weather. I'm sure nobody here uh, confuses climate and weather. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that because we've had uh, the hottest year forever, probably this last year, it will be hot next year. What is frightening is that we have had, uh, of the 10 hottest years in history, nine of them have been in the last 14 years. That, that's the frightening thing. Uh, and uh, we have to recognize, therefore, that we are facing a wholly different circumstance. Now, why should, that, why should that matter to investors? Well, there are two key reasons. The first is that it is a real impact. We have to think about what that means about the companies we invest in, because those companies are facing entirely different problems from those that they would have faced uh, before this became so uh, uh, very evident. We're going to face shortage of water. We're going to face, it, leave alone elsewhere, but in this country, which is, in a sense, one of the most fortunate countries, we're going to face a situation in which we will have both flooding and drought in the same year. So the ability of companies to handle that is a crucial part of how they're going to sort out their profitability in the future. If you are exposed to shortage of water, if you are in a place where flooding is going to become endemic, then that has a real part of your sensible due diligence when you look at those companies. So there are, there's the very direct facts of climate change. But the second is that we do know the direction of action in the world. In most things, we have very little knowledge of the future. We, we think of the past, and you know those advertisements would say that, that past um, 
uh, figures don't necessarily uh, tell you what a, an investment fund will, will do in the future. We, 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 we have to admit that we base our judgments on a, a, a cynical view of the past. We, we think it may be more or less like that. We've got experience, but um, uh, it might not be. Uh, we try to judge what's happening in trends. Uh, I run a business called Sancroft, and one of the things that we do is to try to help people work out where the, where the new threats are coming, and it's a, a, a tough and difficult business, but you have to do it. Uh, but one thing we do know is that the world is signed up uh, to combating climate change, and we know that it will become more signed up because climate change becomes more and more obvious all the time. So it is very difficult for Lord Lawson to make his arguments now stand because people know it isn't true, what he says, because they've experienced it. Um, 20 years ago, which is when I think he started on the subject, uh, it was more difficult because we, we, we hadn't tuned into it. Now, now it is very hard indeed to defend the position uh, which he has. Now, if that's true now, in 10 years' time, that's going to be even more true. So we are going to have a situation in which governments uh, who have committed themselves to making these uh, very big steps uh, are going to be more determined to do so because the public is going to say, we can't go on like this. This is uh, really difficult. And so we do know how the world is moving. And if you know how the world is moving and you're an investor, you do have to recognise that those things are going to affect all the judgments that, uh, that companies make. So if you look at sustainable inv investors, then obviously they're going to need to know that. But I think I think it's become absolutely central that it doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're investing under an SRI banner. It's actually, uh, or, or whether you're merely trying to get the best return without any of those discussions, the fact is this is one of the major things that you have now to take into account. And, and that's, that's one of the two areas where we can see that very, very directly. Mm. Now, now, what will that mean in terms of government action? Well, the first thing we've all seen uh, is that uh, a Conservative government, uh, or at least a Conservative-led uh, coalition, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the time, George Osborne, uh, not seen as one of the great green figures of our history, but it was he who, who enabled $7.6 to be spent on moving our whole power system from fossil fuels to, to renewables and nuclear. Uh, and, and that was a, a crucial decision. Uh, the fact that he could do it, the fact that he felt he had to do it, is one of the things we also have to recognise, which is that this is not something which divides political parties in this country. It does do that in Australia, and it does do that in the United States, but it doesn't do it here. And I do have to say, as an independent, I, I do have to, who's pretty fed up with both the government and the opposition, so I'm in a pretty independent view. Um, the, um, uh, as an independent, I can say absolutely that it doesn't matter to us who is the government. It's easier to be green in opposition. <laughs> That's one of the facts of life. Because when you get into government, it's much more difficult when you've actually got to pay the bills and the rest of it. But uh, the truth is that I've worked under Labour governments and on coalition governments and, uh, and, and Conservative governments, and I have to say, uh, it, it is really true that the government's direction and determination is very similar. And, of course, part of that is that the budgets that we fix are common. The government knows it's got to meet them. And uh, no government has refused to put it before Parliament in an unamended state. It's quite interesting. Five budgets, one after the other, different governments, all put before Parliament without alteration. I'm now starting on the sixth carbon budget, which will take us uh, another five years forward. And, and the trick, if you like, the, the wonderful trick, is that we do them far enough ahead for people to be able to be objective about them. 
Because if you do a budget for the next five years, every member of parliament thinks, oh, that's very bad for my constituency, or that would be very upsetting for this firm or that firm. If you do it far enough ahead, then people are able to be much more objective about it. And once you've established it, as long as you don't let people change them on the way, which is the key thing of the Act, you can actually get this uh, through. Now what, now, what will be the priorities? Well, first of all, uh, the success of reducing our emissions in power has covered up our failures in other areas. So there is a truth in that subtitle of the economies. We have now rising emissions from transport. We have rising emissions too from the built environment. So they are going to be the two next areas with, uh, where there's real pressure. Now, transport is the more, the, is easier because there is an obvious solution to it in the sense that as far as emissions are concerned, and that's not about air quality or indeed uh, congestion, uh, electric vehicles are going to make a huge difference. It doesn't solve what isn't a climate change issue. It doesn't solve the air quality issue because much of the pollution comes from the way brakes work and uh, the way in which the tyre runs on the land, on, on, on the road. Uh, so it doesn't solve that, but it does mean that you could have emission, if you have uh, no emission generation, you can have no emission vehicles. So transport is a little easier because we know there is a route. The government has not yet moved fast enough. It it is not possible to meet their targets if we stick with the 2040 date in which electric vehicles will become the only sort of vehicle you can sell. We've actually got to move that back at least to 2035 and I think actually rather earlier than that. So if you're thinking about investment, I wouldn't be investing in people who need to go on selling to 2040 because I don't think that's where we're going to find ourselves. Uh, it is also true that we haven't yet got uh, an answer to heavy goods vehicles. We can't, uh, the, the mix isn't right yet, and there are various efforts to try to find different ways of doing it, but that's going to be an area where government is going to bear down quite significantly. But the big area of change, I think, is going to be in construction because the construction industry is largely impervious at the moment to the demands of climate change. It is uh, a deeply reactionary industry in many, many ways. And uh, if you just take the house building uh, part itself, the house builders are building houses which are just not fit for meeting the problems we have. Some are better than others, but if you take the nine major house builders uh, who are building something like 80% of the homes that we build, they, they uh, are not building to a level which they ought to be building to and which they could build to. One of our problems is that some of these changes can be done without real difficulties. If you, if you did insist upon building more or less to the standards of the passive house. You wouldn't, in the end, be charging more for the houses. There are two reasons for this. One is that technology means that if it was mass production rather than niche production, much of the uh, material that you need, the, the windows and such like, would fall in price. That's the first thing. But, so it's the technology area would be very much cheaper. But there is also the fact that house prices are really not part of the market. House prices are what people can get for a house in a market which is constrained. And what people can get for a house affects the price they'll pay for the land. And actually, if it costs you 5%, 10% even more to build a house, it won't, but if it did, uh, the land prices would fall by 10% because in the end, the builders would still want to get that margin, and that's what would happen. The trouble is, most building companies have become land speculators, in effect, rather than house builders. And they have too big 
an unused land bank. And in no circumstances, that land bank has been paid for at a price which isn't affected by the mechanisms of which I speak. Now, that shouldn't upset them. I mean, after all, Persimmon seems to have managed to find £107 million to give to its chief executive. Uh, uh, one does have to ask whether the margins are, are quite as tight as it's sometimes suggested. Um, and indeed, one of the things we'd have to ask in any case is, the, is, is the, the fact that it is surprising, isn't it, that we manage to build more or less the same number of houses every year, which happens to be the number of houses which gets the best return on capital for the house builders that you can achieve. It might just have some connection, those two, but still. Now, the fact is the government's not going to go on putting up with this. And so if one, is, if one is investing in house builders, one has to say they're going to have to change the way that they're operating because government can't meet its targets otherwise. And you know what the targets are, and therefore government is going to have to find a way, maybe find a wrong way, if governments are brilliant at doing that, but they will in fact have to find a way of dealing with this issue. Now the same is true of construction as a whole. Uh, with very few exceptions, the major constructors do have a pretty, uh, a pretty exiguous um, uh, hold on what climate change means. And uh, therefore, they are going to find themselves under increasing pressure as it becomes clear that their business is going to be at the heart of what needs to be changed in order for us to meet our targets. And there is one other big area where many will be interested as far as investment is concerned, and that is land. The whole question of land use is going to be absolutely central because after you've dealt with the power generation, once you've done something about uh, transport emissions, uh, and uh, if you're coming to terms with uh, construction, the biggest group of emissions which are most difficult is in fact the emissions from land. Uh, this is difficult for all sorts of contiguous reasons, like, for example, uh, how we deal with um, uh, how, how, how we deal with floods, because land use is going to be very important. And if you look at the, uh, uh, if you look at Defra's 25-year plan, it becomes very clear that they recognise that you're going to have to get farmers to do something quite different in many areas if you're not going to have the flooding that we have. So uh, many people who are invested in land or land-based industries, and after all, our food and farming industries the, is our biggest industry. It's a hugely important industry. It now has a sector council of its own, on which I, I have the pleasure of sitting. And to see this enormous industry, from the retail right the way back to the farm, trying to come to terms with this in the context of a huge and wholesale change in support systems, which would happen were we to leave the European Union. If that's... Uh, this is going to be an area of very, very considerable disturbance. So if you are an investor, thinking about how your investments should be in the food and farming industry is going to be much more complicated and much more difficult than it has been up to now, simply because this is an area of very, very considerable change. Not just about climate change, although that is a fundamental one, but also because, as we all know, the battles about obesity, the whole questions about um, uh, support for farming, all that is now in, 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 in real question. So, uh, again, we come to another area where investors need to be very serious about what climate change means in order to make the right decisions and in order to see where the problems are really going to arise. So let me bring that all together to finish with. You don't any longer have to have an argument about whether climate change is happening, not just because it is so obvious and the science is so strong, but because the world has decided it is happening and that human beings are dealing with it. And therefore, it is best to live in the real world. Now, I know that's, an, that's a very unusual thing to say in these times of Brexit, where it appears to me that a whole lot of people are living in an entirely parallel universe that I don't understand at all, Mr... <laughs> Mr. Rees-Mogg appears to live in a universe which no one understands, but it does seem to me that we are, that we are in a world where 
Politicians are now talking very often nonsense because it's not about what, I'm, I'm not arguing the case, although everyone knows I'm a fervent and passionate Remainer, but the fact of the matter is I'm arguing whether you deal with facts or not. And I'm afraid we live in a world where increasingly facts don't seem to matter. So you are able to say that the European Union is similar to the USSR under Stalin. How can you say that? That cannot in any sense be true. So I don't uh, try to put before you a, um, a rationale uh, which uh, uh, is easy because I want us to face the facts. Now, the only thing is, as Mrs. Thatcher would say, in the end, you can buck the market for a bit, but in the, uh, in the end, the market bucks you. <laughs> this is, I think, true about facts. You can ignore the facts for a bit, but in the end, the facts actually force themselves on you. And investment is about getting those facts right and getting the timing of those facts right. And so for me, the facts are clear, and we are very lucky that they are, and because it gives us a real edge if we're prepared to look at those facts and see those facts and see how they are going to work through. And lastly, we have to do it because it is an existential threat. I had a bit of a, an argument a bit earlier on this afternoon on the subject of why one should exclude nuclear power. I'm not very keen on nuclear power, but it is a necessary transitional mechanism for us to get to where we have to get, and the Climate Change Committee has made that very clear. We, we actually need it. So to think of it as in the terms of gambling or something seems to me to be a mistake as far as exclusions are concerned. But, but, the, but the point that in the course of this, somebody said, well, not, not, not everything is climate change. Not everything is climate change. Well, no, not everything is climate change, but climate change is everything. In other words, if we don't get this right, then talking about uh, providing homes for the uh, old are going to be absolutely otios, because that's not going to be where we're going to be. And I'm going to end in a rather surprising way, perhaps. I want to just say that the, it's the 10th anniversary of the Climate Change Committee, but it's the third anniversary of the Pope's Laudato Si, the uh, encyclical about climate change. And if you haven't read it, it doesn't matter what your religious views are, but if you haven't read it, it's, it's 50 pages of sheer gold. It's, it's beautifully written, and it brings all these things together in a way which I, don't, I haven't seen anywhere else. But the key thing that he says, which for me is the key issue, is that climate change is fundamentally a symptom. It's a symptom of the way that we have looked at the world and the short-term manner in which we have handled our resources and our relationships. So it may not be everything, but it does say a great deal about our social policies. It says a great deal of our policies that deal with uh, our um, resources. It says a great deal about our present greed and our lack of understanding about tomorrow. So perhaps behind all this, we can also say that uh, uh, climate change uh, matters to investors because the world is beginning to wake up right across that board. And that encyclical did more to change the views of Republicans in the United States than any other single action. So, if you think this is worthwhile, then I'm pleased. If you don't think it's worthwhile, I'm not investing with you because that would be clearly not to understand what the, where the world is going. Uh, if you like to involve yourself in the whole issue, um, my Twitter feed is at Lord Deben. I have the largest number of trolls, I think, of anyone <laughs> in the business, um, because what I say is what I think, and um, that uh, cheers people on for most of the cases, but infuriates some people. So I'm always in favour of people uh, joining in order that I have a few more people <laughs> fighting the trolls, um, and I'd like to see you there um, and to keep this going. Because in the end, it is the existential battle. It does matter to us as a race, not just because we could be destroyed if we don't get it right, 
but because it asks of us something which is deeply human, we have in advance of it happening to act to stop it happening. We know, therefore we are responsible. I, I always think this is the crucial thing. The, tri the tree of knowledge is one of the oldest images that we have. Adam and Eve were not responsible until they knew. My son was writing a book about the Black Death at the time that I first became really actively involved in the matter on climate change. And like all fathers, if any of you here have had this experience, as the chapters came off the computer, father had to read them. And I was reading them and suddenly realized what the difference was. One in three of the population died because of the Black Death. But no one was responsible because nobody knew why it was. It was called an act of God, because God gets blamed for anything you don't actually understand. So, and they all did the wrong things. They all gathered together and gave it to each other, because it was not the rats, it was people who gave it to each other. The thing about climate change is that we do know. We do know, and we know how to stop it. And if we know, then we are responsible. Responsible for ourselves, for our children, and for our grandchildren. And if we're investing, we are even more responsible because in the choices we make, we make it easier or harder to battle against climate change. And that is a matter of humanity. That is about what we are as human beings. And that's why, for me, it is the most crucial material thing that faces us. Thank you very much.